Well, good evening, everyone. It's where to get started. And thanks for coming to our Tick Talk. My name is Mark Grove, and I'm with the Livingston County Health Department. And we kind of put this together for you. And I work in the Environmental Health Division of the Health Department. And we have some other staff this evening here who are joining us as well from the Department of Health. Thank you, everyone. And before we get started, uh, I just want to mention there's a couple of surveys that we're sending around. Hopefully everybody can fill those out. We have one on the actual PIC presentation. The other one's not entirely related, but it's something at the health department that would be great to value us on emergency preparedness. So appreciate you filling those out and returning them. Um, so we have two speakers this evening. We have Dr. Aaron Farney and Mr. Lynn Brayband. And I'm going to introduce them momentarily. But first, I want to tell you a little bit more about uh, what we hope to get out of tonight's presentation. All right. So, why do we care about tick-borne disease? What, what does it mean to us? Well, we're going to we're going to hear more about that. Um, we're going to talk about how to identify ticks and their characteristics. We're going to tell you how to protect yourself from ticks and proper tick removal. Well, I emphasize proper because there's a right way and a wrong way. To remove ticks. And we're going to share with you some available resources. Uh, one of those I'll mention, uh, if you fill out your tick survey, you also get a free tick kit. These are fantastic. There's a lot of really neat stuff in here. I think you'll find, and uh, they're kind of multi-purpose. So fill out your, your survey and you get a tick removal kit. Another resource I want to mention is the um, health department on our website. We have, a, I think, a really great tick webpage. And so if you go on to the Livingston County's website under Department of Health, under Environmental Health, you'll see our tick page. And uh, there's some really, you can't read them where you are, but there's some really great things here on the side about ticks. There's also a fantastic, really short video on proper tick removal. Okay. Um, so at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Aaron Farney, who's going to tell you a little bit about himself. And he's going to talk more about the kind of medical aspects of ticks and Lyme disease. And uh, then we'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Brayback. So, Dr. Farney, thank you. I also got to read the slides here, too. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yep. And uh, that's good. All right. So, a little bit about my background. Um, I'm an emergency medicine and EMS physician. I work for the University of Rochester. I'm also on the Board of Health here in Livingston County, which is how I got kind of segued into this talk. Um, so, I'm not an infectious disease doctor. I've also never personally had Lyme disease. So, folks who have either of those are also classified as content experts. So, uh, feel free to chime in, uh, you know, and I'm sure there's some healthcare providers here as well. So my usual audience is paramedics and EMTs and emergency medicine residents. It's kind of my first time talking to a, a sort of general non-medical audience. So if I kind of go over things a little fast, just shout out, raise your hand, tell me to slow down and back up. All right? So why do I care about ticks? I've never had to take care of somebody in the emergency department because they suffered a severe injury from a tick bite, right? It's not like a dog bite or a cat bite where we actually have some wounds to repair, irrigate, etc. So the bite itself isn't terribly serious in most cases. The reason that I care about ticks is ticks are dirty and they carry disease. And that disease can be transmitted to my patients. And that's, that's why I care about ticks. That's why I'm here to kind of talk a little bit about that. So the big disease that uh, most of us have heard of and is probably the most prevalent one that uh, we would run into here in Western upstate New York is Lyme disease. So up on the uh, presentation on the slide, there's some numbers of cases of confirmed Lyme disease in Livingston County over the last five years. And you can see it's pretty remarkable the cases have increased by three to four fold just in the past five years. And that follows a national trend of increasing prevalence of Lyme disease throughout the country, particularly in the Northeast and Upper Midwest Minnesota area. So Lyme disease is increasingly something that you can run into, particularly if you're exposed to ticks. So while, while those numbers are generally low, keep in mind that that is just Livingston County. That's not all of New York State. 
Um, why is that? I don't have all the answers to that. Some of it might have to do with the tick population. Some of it may have to do with the prevalence of those ticks actually carrying the diseases amongst themselves. So there's a number of tick-borne diseases, as I alluded to. Um, we could talk uh, all night long about them. The one that's probably most relevant here is Lyme disease. So, excuse me. So Lyme disease is spread by the bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, it is carried by the deer tick, also known as the black-legged tick. So this is the this is a very prevalent tick in this area. Um, uh, that's those are some pictures of it uh, at different life stages, and I believe the adult males on the left, and the adult females on the right. It's got black legs. I think that's why it's called that. So, um, how, how do you have a sense that you might have been exposed to ticks? Well, the first thing is that you were out in the wilderness, or you were out in the woods, or the brush adjacent to the woods, tall grass, anywhere that these these ticks re excuse me these ticks reside. Um, Lynn's going to get a little bit more into that later. Um, the second thing is that you've actually seen the tick on you. So the tick crawling on you, probably not as big a deal, wipe it off. The tick that's actually bitten into you, that's when we start talking about disease transmission. Where to look for those ticks? The truth is they can be anywhere, but these are some of the more common areas. So if you've been out in the woods or you've been out in a grassy area where you could have been exposed to ticks, these are the places you want to pay good attention to. Anecdotally, um, when I've taken care of folks in the emergency department with ticks attached to them, it's often in the back of the knees in what we call the popliteal fossa. Part of that is because that's an accessible area. It's down near the grass where the ticks are. Also, most people don't check that area. It's hard to see. It's on your backside. So it's helpful if you have a friend or a loved one at home that can check you over after you come out of the woods as well. Questions on that? So it's not enough just to have been bitten by a tick. If the tick's only on there for a couple minutes, it's very unlikely that that tick is going to transmit disease. Um, most sources cite 36 hours as this sort of like magical, maybe a little arbitrary number where um, over 36 hours we start to get worried about disease transmission. There are reports of disease transmission in under 36 and even under 24, but those are much more rare, it's much less likely. So it's not like a black and white all or nothing if the tick was only on for 20 hours you can't get Lyme disease, that's not necessarily true, but it's much more likely it's the longer the tick's been on, the more likely a disease transmission process can occur. And that's why it's so important to get that tick off of you early. If you come in from the woods, you do a good inspection, and you make sure that tick's been removed, the likelihood of contracting a tick-borne disease is very less likely. So suppose that you've reasonably or plausibly been exposed to a tick, or, or you know you've been exposed to a tick because you found one and it was on you, um, how do you know that you might be developing Lyme disease, which would be probably the most prevalent uh, disease in this area from a tick? Well, one of the first clues, and I don't know if there's a way we can get these front lights down for a second. Uh, maybe not. It's probably all right now. Put them So, um, this is the part where everybody falls asleep, which is good. Um, on the left, it's uh, the classic. Lyme disease rash, it's an erythema migrans, which is a bullseye rash. So anybody who shopped at Target, it's, it's like the Target logo, right? Um, bullseye right where the, where the tick bit. Um, that's classic, uh, so long as the tick and the patient who was bitten by the tick read the textbook and knew that that's what the rash is supposed to look like. That's not always the case. Um, you can see to the right, it's a little more purpley, uh, a little less red. And there's all different variations of it. So um, keep in mind that only 70 to 80 percent of people who've been bitten by a tick and who contract Lyme disease actually get an erythema migraines rash. So it's not uh, 100 percent reliable. So 20 to 30 percent of patients with Lyme disease won't display the rash or perhaps didn't see it because it's on their backside. But that's potentially the first clue. 
Um, that's when the disease is potentially still localized. That's definitely an indication that you need to seek help here. Um, certainly, I'm open 24-7. I'm not always there 24-7, but somebody is. Um, but also, your local primary care physician um, is, is able to manage this as well. Um, once it's spread beyond locally, you can get some more systemic symptoms. And it's okay if we can turn the lights back on. Thank you. So this is sort of the bane of emergency medicine, right? Because half of the patients that come into the emergency department um, have these <laughs> symptoms up top. Uh, fevers, chills, headache, fatigue, muscle and joint aches. Um, what do most patients who have those symptoms from December to March have? The flu. The flu. Yeah. So this, this is really tough. Now the good news is that generally speaking, and I think at some point in Lynn's presentation maybe, um, there's a graph that shows sort of Lyme disease prevalence throughout the year. And the good news is that for the most part, it's kind of the opposite of the flu. Although you could have an atypical flu season that drags into the spring a little bit. So kind of now is that time where it's like, eh, is it the flu or is it Lyme disease? Um, so what, are, what do you think some clues might be that it's one or the other? So if somebody comes in with those symptoms up top. Look for a Yeah. So flu is probably not going to cause that target lesion bullseye, right? You've been hiking. hiking. Yeah, you've been exposed. You've been out in the woods or in the tall grass, or you know a tick that you. Yeah. So those are kind of the clues we're relying on. So those are really important symptoms when you come in to the emergency department or to your primary care physician to let them know, hey, I was walking out in the woods. Um, I know sometimes it's really annoying when we're asking question after question after question and you want to know what the blood work showed, but we don't know what blood work to order until you know, we've got those questions out of the way. Um, so that's where some of those questions come from. Doctor? Yes. How soon after a bite would a person begin to exhibit symptoms? That's a great question, and the answer is it depends. <laughs> um, about three to 30 days. No, no. The rash be gone? Maybe the rash is typically going to present first, but again, not everybody gets the rash. Mm -hmm. And that can be anywhere in the first one to three weeks. Um, the symptoms, those other symptoms, anytime in the first month. Um, the incubation period can be as short as a few days and as long as a few weeks. Um, generally speaking, if you're several months out, it's probably unrelated. But, um, but yeah. Any other questions? So if left unchecked, untreated, Lyme disease has the potential to what we call disseminate, which means spread throughout the, the body and cause other systemic symptoms. Um, so symptoms of disseminated Lyme disease come a little bit after that first stage, so now we're talking you know, maybe several weeks out to a month or more. Um, patients can get neurologic complaints, headache, stiff neck, uh, cognitive issues, memory impairment. Uh, they can get that same rash that I was talking about spread throughout the rest of the body in various areas, even where the tick didn't bite them. Um, another sort of more specific symptom, we like specific symptoms in emergency medicine because it kind of points us in one direction or the other, would be joint inflammation involvement. So when I was trained, one of the things, whenever I hear somebody come in with multiple joints hurting, is to think Lyme disease. Um, that's one of a million possibilities of what could be going on, but there aren't, not, like the flu typically doesn't cause joint, joint inflammation. It can, but it's unlikely. Sometimes people get cardiac or heart um, rhythm abnormalities. That's less likely, but it can uh, be an indicator that there's been some heart involvement with the Lyme disease. They can get things like myocarditis or pericarditis, which are inflammation of the heart muscle itself or the, the lining around the heart. Um, dizziness and shortness of breath, and then uh, some numbness and tingling. So as you can imagine, these are all individually non-specific symptoms. So there's not one specific thing that's, this is absolutely Lyme disease. It's that constellation of symptoms with the exposure or potential exposure to tick and Lyme disease. So if we can get the lights on real quick just for a second. Uh, this is a picture of the disseminated European migrants with the disseminated Lyme disease rash. So 
uh, multiple rashes throughout the body, not necessarily just where the tick bit. Thank you. Um, once a healthcare provider clinician suspects Lyme disease, um, the testing is as complicated as the presentation and symptoms. So it's, it, it's not a straightforward, let's just send this lab off and it'll be back in 45 minutes and we'll know. You know, it's not, it's not as simple as like a pregnancy test. So this is another vein of emergency medicine, right? This isn't a test that I'm going to send off and it's going to be back in a meaningful amount of time for me. Meaningful time frame for me in the emergency department is two hours. Um, this test could take days or longer. Um, and a lot of laboratories, particularly in small hospitals, are not going to be able to run this. They're going to have to send it out somewhere to a laboratory off-site. Um, and it's a two-step process. So the first uh, step is an enzyme immunoassay or uh, immunofluorescence assay. Um, so what they're essentially doing is they're looking for protein from the uh, Lyme bacteria itself in the blood. Um, these are called screen tests, meaning they have high sensitivity. So it means that if you have true Lyme disease, it's likely this test is going to be positive. The problem with the first test is it's not necessarily specific, which means there can be false positives. So that first test might come back positive. That doesn't necessarily mean you have Lyme disease. It could mean you've been exposed to it in the past, or you've been exposed to uh, one of that bacteria's cousins that kind of looked the same and <coughs> generated a similar antibody. So uh, there's a secondary test, a Western blot, that's followed up that's more specific to confirm the diagnosis. And this is typically beyond my house. This is not something I'm ordering in the emergency department. This is followed up either through your primary care physician um, or an infectious disease or the public health clinic. If we truly suspect Lyme disease in the emergency department, we are going to initiate empiric treatment while we're waiting confirmatory testing. And that's in, in line with guidelines from the CDC, et cetera. So I just want to go over a couple myths, and then I'll turn it over to Lynn. So myth one, if you find a tick on a body, you should take antibiotics. So as I alluded to earlier, um, just because they're a tick bit you doesn't necessarily mean that disease transmission occurred. One, we don't know that that tick was actually infected. It's not like 100% of the ticks are walking around carrying Lyme disease. Um, but then those that do, they have to have been on you probably around 36 hours or more to have actually transmitted it. So it's helpful to know when you last uh, were out exposed to it, how long that uh, tick may have been on you. Um, guidelines are kind of iffy on this. Uh, last I read from the CDC, was um, if the tick is thought to have been on you for 36 hours based on history or the appearance of the tick, um, if we're able to safely remove it and there's no contraindication and we can start uh, a prophylactic dose, a lot of times what I'll do is offer a single dose of an antibiotic called doxycycline in the emergency department. The evidence isn't 100% clear that that's going to nip this in the bud and prevent it from ever happening, um, but generally the CDC sort of says, yeah, that's, that's reasonable practice. Again, if it's only been on you for five minutes, probably not worth it because um, every uh, medicine we give you, any antibiotic has the potential for an allergic reaction or other adverse could interact with other medications you're on and cause more trouble than it was worth it. Uh, myth two is testing the bug. If you bring me a tick in the emergency department and ask me to test it for Lyme disease, I will probably give it back to you. Um, we can't do that in the emergency department. The other thing is it, it does not really tell us whether you have Lyme disease, right? Like, I'm not going to treat, I'm not going to give the, the tick antibiotics. Um, what I care about is whether you actually have it. So we, we prefer to clinically evaluate you as the patient and, and treat accordingly rather than treat the tick itself. One of the things got good insurance. Well, I'm actually blinded to it. I, I, I'll never know if it's a right. Myth three. Um, some people who get chronic Lyme disease will be sick for the rest of their lives. So again, chronic Lyme disease isn't really my wheelhouse in the emergency department. But generally speaking, folks who develop kind of more significant sequelae of Lyme disease after that first month or two typically, for the most part, can be treated with an infectious disease specialist or rheumatologist, 
and oftentimes don't uh, manifest symptoms for the rest of their lives. But again, that's, that's not really my wheelhouse. Um, but uh, it's not something that I want folks to fear that, you know, this is going to be a forever debilitating disease uh, if I'm exposed to it. Okay. Um, any questions on the medical end, particularly from the emergency medicine perspective? Go ahead. Uh, this one, but is there any progression that's obvious in terms of, say, you did get bit by the tick and you got that, you, you missed the fact, that, or you didn't show that circle? Uh, there is a progression that you want to look for other symptoms later on, say three months, a year from the point that you got bit and stuff? Yeah, so again, I'm, I'm kind of focused on that first month or so, and that's going to be your nonspecific flu-like symptoms. So you got bit by a tick, and initially you were fine. You may or may not have had that rash. If you had that rash, that's going to markedly increase my suspicion that you've been exposed to Lyme disease. Um, but the fever malaise, the neurologic symptoms, sort of those non-specific fatigue, muscle aches, joint aches in particular, those are if those things are happening, go to your doctor. Uh, get checked out, let them know, hey, you know, this is on my mind, I was exposed to tick or possibly exposed to ticks, um, and, and talk it over with them. So they I hope would be aware of progression to look for other symptoms later on, like, you know, the fall, I was out hiking, didn't notice it, went all winter, Spring comes along and all of a sudden I start having problems and yeah, yeah was it a tick or not? You know, is there other symptoms three months later or four months later that would still indicate that, oh yeah, maybe I did have a problem? And, and, and I would say that if, if you're really suspicious that this could be Lyme disease, bring that up and specifically say that. Because from the doctor perspective, that's one of hundreds of oh, things yeah. your symptoms could be. So they're, they're going to be thinking broadly. But if you, if you have a pretty good suspicion that you were exposed to something, uh, or were out in the woods with ticks, etc., mention that. That's kind of another problem to my other question then is, are there other uh, parasites or something that could be transmitted by this tick or other ticks that are in the area? Yeah. So, um, I'm not going to go all the way back, but there was a slide with a list of other bugs. Okay, I'm just going to um, Or ehrlichiosis, babesiosis, um, anesoplasmosis. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, most of those, fortunately, are not endemic in this area. Um, not super common. Problem is, all of those diseases have very similar non-specific viral prodrome presentations. So we're looking for something that looks like a virus and then take it from there. Yeah. So. All right. Um, cool. Go ahead. One last question. The, the actual flight site, does it swell up like a bee sting or a mosquito sting? Does it bleed? Great question. Uh, yes and no. Um, there is, some people can have a little bit of an allergic, localized allergic reaction, not, not a systemic, like life-threatening type, but a little bit of redness, swelling, pain at the site. Um, those are typically the folks who are going to notice the tick, um, but not always. Most of the ticks I've removed, once the tick's gone, you can barely tell a tick was there. So, quick question. Do they, when the tick bites you, do you actually feel it or do you not feel it? A lot of people don't. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And I, I've taken care of folks who've been, been, you know, they don't know when they take that. They just notice it. Some All right, I'm going to turn it over to Lynn, and then I think at the end there may be some time for more questions. Okay, good evening. Hey, my name is Lynn Bradman. I'm with the New York State Integrated Test Management Program. Uh, we are a statewide uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension Program that does the extension thing of applied research and adult education on how to manage pests uh, and while reducing risks, risks of pesticides and other risks. And uh, uh, if, if you're interested, I have a few copies of our annual report, our most recent annual report, which uh, our creative uh, writers put in the form of a calendar. So, don't be confused, it's not last year's calendar. It's 27, the fiscal, last, the, last, the previous fiscal year annual report that's in the form that's in, uh, embedded within a 2019 calendar. <laughs> so, two disclaimers, I'm glad that Dr. Farney was here, because we say we're tick people, we're not disease people. So, uh, the most of that, in this presentation, we get the disease, 
is just uh, there's one slide which shows the, um, the known diseases associated with the three ticks from which we can get disease uh, in New York State currently. And also, uh, I'm not going to get into with this audience too much into pesticides. Uh, if, we're, if, we have, if we're talking pesticide applicators, we do, um, except we will be talking about repellent use, you know, the personal protection. So, your choice. You want to see the slides better or my beautiful face in terms of the lights? <laughs> What's that? Slides. Slides? Uh, okay, well, let me know if it's too, if it's too light, we, uh, or t and we'll turn off the... Uh... Okay, now, we received money uh, from the State Senate to develop this statewide program on reducing your risk of being, getting bit by a tick. Okay? And we spent a lot of time thinking about the title, and we settled on Don't Get Tick New York. And these are the, the, uh, the, uh, the objectives of this statewide campaign. And this is what we're looking at today. First, a key component of approaching any pest situation with an integrated pest management approach is the biology of the pest. Okay. And so we'll first talk about some basics about, uh, uh, about the pest itself, the ticks, a little bit about diseases, and very importantly, the hosts of the ticks. And then we'll talk about preventing tick bites through integrated pest management and also the proper removal of an embedded tick. And this is the take home message. Okay, there's a lot, as Dr. Farney indicated, there's a lot of misinformation out there. You know, if it's online, it's got to be correct, right? And so these are just a collection of things that one of our educators took offline. And this little uh, interchange over here turned out to be didn't even turn out to be ticks. Like, oh yeah, those are ticks. They were mice. <laughs> so look at basic biology. Um, which of these critters is a tick? No, yeah, on your left that is. Why do you say that? Legs. legs? Yeah, they both have legs. Well, the body. Yeah, that's a good point, body. Um, so this is a, ticks are arachnid, which is in a very large group, which includes spiders. And the adult ticks, when they're, when they're first hatched, they have six legs, like insects do. But adult ticks and other arachnids have eight legs, four pairs of legs. And while insects, such as this spider over here, have three pairs of legs, six, six legs. Also, somebody mentioned the body. Insects have the classic three body parts. You know, ticks, arachnids have two body parts. Um, by the way, what is this guy? Bed bug, yeah. <laughs> and uh, this, as we'll discuss later, this is not a black legged tick. This is uh, kind of a newcomer to the state, although in Long Island it looks like it's become more common than the black legged tick. This is the Lone Star tick. It gets its name because the adult female has a spot in its mouth. Okay, so there are a lot of tick species in general, and there's a lot in New York State. But there are only three from which uh, we know we can get you know, zoonotic disease, disease uh, that can be transmitted to, to, uh, to humans. And so these are the three we focus on. Again, over on the, the far right is the black legged tick, which entomologists will say that's the proper name for the deer tick. And uh, this is the one which I described uh, earlier, the lone star tick, which used to be a, a southern tick. But it's, but it's uh, spreading to the north and getting way downstate. Long Island is very, very common now. It has been found up here. Uh, it's unclear whether there are established populations of the Lone Star or if, like they dropped off birds or something like that. And then we have the American dog tick, also known as the wood tick. Uh, this is probably our most common tick in the area. And when I was growing up in the Midwest, this is the only tick we talked about. And the only tick-borne disease we talked about was Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which this guy's here. And uh, you saw this kind of, uh, I guess this slide over here, similar before, I guess the, the sexes are reversed in the slide Dr. Farney have. But uh, in each of these, this is the, uh, uh, when they're hatched, they're known as the larvae. And then they become the teenage tick, the nymph. And these are the two adult stages. Um, in all three, the female is larger than the male. <coughs> And these all can have Lyme disease? No, no, no. Only, they all can carry human diseases. But the black legged tick is the only one which carries Lyme disease. So, 
You may have heard about this guy, the Asian Longhorn Tick, which was a couple of years ago was found on a sheep, covering a sheep in New Jersey, and has been found in New York State, especially downstate. Um, it's, uh, it, it, although it only has been discovered in the last couple of years, it's very similar to a native tick on rabbits, and so it's probably was overlooked for quite a while. And um, there's a lot of work going on now because there's just a lot we don't understand about this. And so just a few things, again, it discovered New Jersey in large numbers in 2017 and found other states. In New York, these are the counties it's been uh, uh, found in. And uh, uh, this is interesting, females can reproduce without a male. So it doesn't need two to tangle. In fact, all the Asian longhorn takes which have been found today in this country have been female. It can reproduce asexually, parthenogenically. And um, thus, can, when, any female, one female, can lead to a new population of these. Are there no males? Uh, in the native range in Asia, yes. But not here so far. That haven't found. Okay. Um, so, in its native range, it, it's a known um, veterinary pest, a pest on livestock. Um, transmitting disease to livestock and even becoming so common on livestock can cause anemia. And so, for like our three native ticks here, you're not going to get anemia from that because you know you, you don't get covered with ticks as such. But but, uh, uh, but no tested ticks, it, and there's some potential in this native range of carrying human pathogens anyway. Having a, having a um, an invertebrate that has a human pathogen is not the same as being able to acquire it. Okay? And but but anyway, none of the tested ticks, and there's been a lot of work that are going on. More work to be done so far have any human pathogens or veterinary pathogens. Anemia is a concern. New York has a potential suitable climate because we have a very similar climate to its native range. And so this is a projection map based on the climate of its native range. What's the potential range, you know, for long? It doesn't mean it's hit th that far, but that's just climate-wise, what might be the range for this. Okay, so in terms of this new tick, we don't know much about it right now. Okay, and, and right now we're just trying to, to, to get a basic information even on its distribution within this country. Okay, back to general discussion about ticks. Ticks are blood feeding ectoparasites, means they feed in the outside of a, of the, of a host. Um, they don't hunt you down. Most species ambush you with what's known as question behavior. So that's a black legged tick doing the question behavior. They get to the edge of a, of a, of a tip of vegetation, a leaf, and they put out the front legs and they wait. Some come by and grab onto. So they don't jump, they don't have wings, they can't fly. Um, and the Lone Star tick is a little bit more active hunter, that it will follow CO2 trails, same thing as mosquitoes do. Doesn't mean that it will go from here to the other side of the room, but if you're walking along a trail and you sit down for a while in the middle of the trail, if there's Lone Star ticks in the grass next to the trail, it may start moving this way towards you. Ticks are small. Okay, so again, larva, nymph, don't male, don't female, black like a tick. <coughs> I'm a human digit. Okay, they are committed, so, uh, you know, mentioned, you know, you have a tick on you, if you don't even know it's been five minutes, it hasn't even embedded you. They, uh, they, one of their major adaptive strategies, they're a small little critter, they want to go unnoticed. And so they don't want to be noticed by the host animal because they're probably getting be dead, <laughs> you know. And so they, they slowly make their way to a, from a tick's perspective, a good place. And, eat, and that, that song tends to take a while. And when they start feeding, you see it takes several days to become in, um, enlarged. Yes? Can you go back to that previous one, please? The previous slide? Yeah, that's amazing. I just want to get a capture of that. Okay. How long will it take to ask about food? Takes? They don't. No. They can't get food. Yeah, they can't, they can't finish the reproductive cycle without a blood people. Uh, but they can, they, but, uh... How long can they not, eat there for Yeah, they can stay, they can, they can, they can hang on the leaf litter for a long time. <laughs> Especially the adults. But. Okay, this is a close-up. You just show the, the business end of ticks. Also, they don't dig under your skin. You know, it's only the mouth parts. Okay, ticks are long-lived. 
And uh, so here's our three ticks, up here three ticks of um, medical importance. And uh, uh, you, you see that the black legged tick has a two year life cycle. Um, American dog tick uh, uh, also has a two year life cycle. Can, and can survive. The book has maybe not two years, but it can survive up to two years in any given life stage. Kind of partially answers your question for that species anyway. Lone star ticks have a quicker life cycle. Maybe short as eight months, but the black-legged tick, you know, our, our our main star of concern here tonight has this, has this classic two-year life cycle. We'll look at that in more detail. And again, the Asian longhorn ticks, we just don't know enough about it yet. So, Dr. Farney mentioned that uh, part of the uh, detective work on what type of disease you might have is in the time of the year. And so, his black-legged ticks seasonal. They have this two-year cycle. And so uh, uh, here we are in May, and the uh, uh, well, we have the the we have, we still have adults around, but this time of year you you have the teenage ticks, the nymphs, which have finished their first year. We we'll have a little graphic to show that, but it's in this late spring into 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 summer that nymphs are particularly common, and then we have the the new crop, the larvae, which are hatched over here. And then these nymphs have developed, uh, these nymphs over here have then have molted into adults, and that's the, the uh, you know, the common overwintering stage along, uh, yeah, with the eggs, which are laid. Lone star for now is a little bit more collapsed, as you can see, and so you can have a, a all life stages or a um, lot, lot closer to each in terms of frequency. Can they uh, bite at any stage? Yes. <laughs> but uh, they, they do have preferences in the types of hosts, as we'll discuss shortly. <laughs> so, uh, ticks have preferred habitats. You see this color code here. Um, so the black-legged tick. Black-legged tick, its Achilles heel is that in order to survive, it needs high humidity. Microenvironments of high humidity, 80% or more. Okay. So that doesn't mean you wouldn't find them out here in the arid lawn. From an inverted point of view, our lawns are pretty, you know, they're dry, they're arid. And because uh, it might drop off of something that's walked through, but it can't survive there and reproduce at long. Okay. So, that, so the black-legged ticks are classically usually found in the leaf litter, in the thick brush, especially on the edge of the woods, because, that's because they need a humid, high humid climate. Uh, the Lone Star Tick and the American, well, the American Dog Tick especially is more classically associated with tall grass. And the Lone Star Tick can be quite common uh, yeah, like places like on Long Island and down in the turf on the lawn itself. So here is a, a little research, uh, I think it was a, a school downstate, or a park, no, a park downstate, where they, were, they uh, searched for the ticks and uh, here they found, uh, in, in the grass itself, they found a lot of American dog ticks, also known as the wood ticks, the lone star ticks, and um, uh, the black-legged ticks at this center, as would be expected, but limited to the wood lineage. Does winter have any effect on them? It doesn't, it doesn't uh, uh, for the black-legged tick, it doesn't kill them. In fact, if you have a good thaw in the winter, if it gets above freezing, you don't have the snow cover, the adults can become active. So, heat is more the Achilles, dry heat is more the Achilles of the, the black-legged tick than, than cold. And we'll describe later how you can use that to your advantage. Okay, so this is the two-year life cycle of the black-legged tick. <coughs> so, the, the, the eggs are laid in the leaf litter. And when they hatch in the summer, they, they become larvae. And... Uh, all the evidence points toward that even if the female which laid the eggs was carrying the Lyme disease bacteria, it does, it does not transmit, this is for Lyme disease, to the, to the egg of the larvae. Okay? And so the larvae tend to find, go for small hosts, small animals. And, and, and that could be a wide variety of things. Small rodents, small birds, down in the southeast, lizards are important. Um, but up, up here in the northeast, well, we'll, we'll talk about the small mammal, which is most commonly associated with not only the, the tick, but the Lyme disease. But
But if the host animal had, is carrying the Lyme disease bacteria, that's when the larvae, when it feeds upon the host animal, can pick up the bacteria. So they're not hatched with it in terms of Lyme disease, but they can pick it up if the host they feed upon gets it. So we got a little graphic there to show that. So the, the larvae feeds and gorge, it drops off back to the leaf litter. Once it has a, the bacteria, apparently it, keep, it, 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 it has it for life. Okay. And so then it bolts into the TH tick, the nymph, um, and if it's and, and where it, it tends it tends to go again to a small mammal. It might go for a large animal also uh, as a nymph because um, that's uh, including humans. Uh, but if it if it didn't get the, the, the Lyme disease bacteria carrying it over here, when it's a larvae feeding, it has another chance here. When gorgeous, it falls off uh, back in the leaf litter and uh, molts into the adults who still have Lyme disease bacteria, and adults tend to look for a large animal deer, humans, dogs, horses. And uh, uh, then that's where the, the adults reproduce. Females need to be have a, a be engorged with a blood meal before they can lay the eggs back in the leaf litter, and the cycle is complete. We have the, and again, we have the, the danger sign for our bacteria to disappear because yeah, the communicant the Lyme disease of bacteria is not transferred to the eggs. Okay. This is from the CDC confirmed cases of the. Uh, uh, of the disease by month, and uh, the, the it's obviously where the peak is, or is it? Yeah. And again, if we think back to that graphic of uh, what life stage is, is most common in, in the black lady ticks in the summer, the nymphs. Yeah. So we consider the nymphs the most dangerous life stage, just because they're so darn small. You get Lyme disease from the adult, but the adults are bigger. Okay, this is a series of maps showing the, the, the spread of confirmed cases of Lyme disease. So one dot indicates um, a confirmed case of Lyme disease. That does not mean that the dot's there, you know, that's where the person was when it, it was diagnosed. It doesn't mean they acquired it there, but undoubtedly most of them were nearby. Okay, so this is in 2001. You know, or even back then, you know, we have a scattering of dots up here in upstate New York, but a lot of them might have been visiting downstate, you know. And, uh, you know, back then, I think many of us consider this, you know, a problem for the little guys downstate. You know, not, not so much for us. Uh, 2006, and the spread, as Dr. Farley mentioned, there's always been two hot spots, the Northeast and the Western Great Lakes. 2011, 14, kind of hard to say, it's just a downstate problem, and two years ago. Okay, there's another look at, the, at that CDC data that confirmed Lyme disease cases, this time by age of um, humans that acquired it, and also sex. And um, uh, what, what, are, what are one or two things that stand out from this graph? Okay. I'm sorry? More males. More males, yeah, yeah. Why is that, you think? Zero. Yeah, to, yeah, in general, human males spend, tend to spend more time in tick habitat. Okay. Um, and anything else? How about peaks? <coughs> Again, we got this peak of people here, humans <coughs> might be, you know, adults that are spending time in tick habitat. Kids. And not only kids, but what? <coughs> Boys. <laughs> okay, I like this graph because it shows two things. Again, it's, it's just not Lyme disease. Lyme disease is by far the most common one, but there are other tick-borne diseases. And this, this color code map shows a, a couple interesting things quickly, just visually. One, it does, get, it, it does communicate that it's more than just Lyme disease. <coughs> And again, it can be misinterpreted because here, purple is Lyme disease. That doesn't mean it's purple, there isn't anything else. It just means, you know, they, it, it covers everything. Um, and so it shows that there are several, you know, several potential diseases, 
And also, it really shows how, hot, how, how much of a hot spot the Northeast is for two form musicians. Okay, um, this, uh, this, this is about as far as uh, in this presentation we'll get disease, but these are the known diseases known to be carried um, by these three species of ticks that we've been talking about. Uh, no conditions. Not all of these are, are pathogen-caused diseases. Uh, so, for example, this one is an interesting allergy related to the bite of a lone star tick, which some people get. And it's a, it's a develops an allergic reaction to a particular protein associated with the tick bite. And this protein is also found in red meat. So, you, so the the victim, if you will, develops an allergy to red meat. So I call this the vegans the vegans delight. <laughs> And this is a paralysis, which I don't know if a lot, not a lot is known about that. I think that's might be associated with the American dog tick, but um, it, um, is it kind of an, an interesting from a medical point of view? I don't, again, know a lot about it, but it's when the tick bites, uh, there's a little paralysis which occurs, and it's removed quickly. Apparently, the paralysis goes away just from the tick bite itself. Also, there's some question whether starry, southern tick associated rash illness, is really caused by a pathogen. A um, couple other things. This one was in, the, was in the paper last year quite a bit, and that there have been deaths in New York State from Wasson virus, but it's very, very rare. Okay, that, that, uh, it's been found in ticks in New York State, but very low levels. Okay, ticks need hosts, and again, there's been hundreds, dozens, and hundreds of, of hosts which have been identified uh, that ticks. That ticks. But there are three, two very important ones um, for the, the other life stages, the, the larvae especially, and the nymphs, uh, the white-footed mouse, which is a very common native mouse, and uh, uh, you see, very common in the types of habitat which we created, fragmented forest, a lot of, a lot of woodland edge, and it, it's what's known as the amplifying host of Lyme disease. In other words, it's a good carrier for the Lyme disease bacteria. And, um, uh, now, in a particular population of mice, more than 90% of the mice in that population can be infected with the bacterium. And in one study, about 50% had Lyme disease bacterium and two other zoonotic diseases. For the adults, the white-tailed deer is important. The ticks cannot... Deer are what's known as a dead-end host for Lyme disease. Uh, ticks cannot get the disease from, from deer. What the deer are are a very excellent platform for tick reproduction. And, you know, apparently with those hooves, deer are not very good at grooming ticks off them. And you look, look at this Bordeaux. Each one of those things is a gorge tick. And then also, you know, probably, uh, look at that, because the yeast deer can produce as many as a half a million ticks. This can have a reproduction platform. And they also probably have a role in the spread of things. Do the deer also suffer from the disease? No, no. So again, they're not important from the Lyme disease bacteria <coughs> perspective, except being a very effective platform for tick reproduction for the black lady. So the mouse is the bacteria? Yes. So then the tick it's not the only one. Ship must scan too. Okay. The white-footed mouse, in terms of frequency, is the most important. Okay. Uh, so this is a quick sample. I think that's a hill outside Albany. Joanna Lantman, who's, a, who's with our program, is, is, is doing a lot of tick work. And she went out and with her tick tray. This, by the way, is a tick tray. You can tell I'm not a seamstress. But the, uh, um, it's a simple device for just dragging along and the ticks glass onto it. You can see them to monitor for ticks. And uh, uh, so she did a tick drag along the woodland edge, and she uh, very quickly caught these, and then she was working, I think, with the Cornell Veterinary Lab um, uh, and, and analysis. And you see, of, of the ticks she caught, uh, about half had Lyme disease, and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and it's smaller percentages for these other three conditions. And, 20, and about a quarter had more than one disease. This is in Albany County. Um, no pause. Okay, so this is a more uh, comprehensive survey 
And I think you can get this from county by county. I mean, you guys might know this better than me. And this is again, this is this was for all the for um, Suffolk County. I believe I believe this is state information is there. We, we get an annual report. Yeah, that right. It tells us the results. Of these. Yeah. So this is uh, and again, this is the average all for this period of 2014 to 2017. And so this is you know divided by those number of years. So this is an annual average. Uh, and so about 60% of the other ticks in Suffolk County that were, were tested had Lyme disease, and you see the smaller percentages than the others. And that was the adults, and this is the NIMS. Okay, so thus ends the development of healthy care. <coughs> okay, so now I'm going to talk about um, taking an IPM approach to ticks. And uh, we, we get calls like this. My kid picked up a, a ticket at school, and uh, this, and related actually, this is more systematic work, which is done in Connecticut and New Jersey, was usually not. You know, a playground is, is not a good environment for a tick. And so often, if they, if they were ticks, they got them on the way to school, at home, or. Uh, <coughs> and. Uh, so again, the, the standard way for surveying for ticks is with a tick drag. Uh, and so, just white flannel, white uh, flannel cloth, and the video going to work here. <laughs> Actually, I'm not sure if because I think a lot are different. Yeah, probably not. Well, I just showed this little tick crawling across, and again, it's white so you can see them, and they don't move real quickly but enough so you can see them. So, another thing is that, uh, so this is a school, I think, in the Albany area that parents call, and they said that the schoolyard is covered with ticks. So we went out there and surveyed weevils. So if you're a turf manager, then you that might be a concern for your turf press, but the principal is very relieved. <laughs> so again, we do a lot of work in schools, and um, so for, like if you do tick surveys, it's kind of a nice thing for a science club and things like that. But what we do with these tick drags is the the, the probable habitats, the woodland edge, is is where you can do your surveys, looking for the areas to confirm where there appear to be ticks, and also maybe compare to year to year. When possible, again, for personal, and now for personal management, it just, when practical and possible, avoid the tick hot spots. You know, when you go on the trail in the woods, you're just casually walking down the middle of the trail. You know, the tick habitat is over here. But you can't always do this. So, Gerald and I mentioned before, this trail is to her favorite fishing hole, which she will not tell anybody where it is. And, uh, but, you know, she has to go through the tick habitat. So, it's not always possible to avoid it. But when, when in tick habitat, dress appropriately, light-colored clothes, why light-colored clothes? So you can see them. So you can see them. In fact, uh, recently I was uh, talking with Miles at Irvine National Wildlife Refuge, and they're kind of issued dark brown uniforms and light-colored uniforms, and recently I've been telling them, wear the light color for this reason. Uh, tuck your pants in the socks. I mean, it, it may not be cool, Although one of our staff says we need to promote that as a new fashion statement, <laughs> you know. And even seal the legs, so here's a photo showing both. <clears throat> Again, they, the ticks want to get undercover in some warm, dark spots. And so you're, 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 you're slowing them down and getting there when you do this. And I don't think I mentioned before, I know Dr. Farley mentioned, where most of the ticks are, the black-legged ticks, and the other ticks too, are like foot in the vegetation, foot and a half down. And what did I do? Go to sleep? Okay, and so this is shows again that when you tuck it in, it just slows them down to getting where they where they want to go. Okay, repellents. Um, so these are the four repellents, which is from the CDC websites, which are shown to have efficacy. Okay. In other words, that they, they are effective. D is still the, it's D is the one which is the most effective. If that's what your highest concern is of effectiveness, it's D. But these others have lesser effectiveness, but they have been shown to, to, to have um, uh, effectiveness. The way repellents work is they don't really 
repel is a hydrogen. They cover those clues, such as CO2 emissions, etc. or not, which mosquitoes or ticks use to find them. There is also, you can, you can um, buy an insecticide to spray your, your field clothes. It's permethrin. So this is an insecticide that kills the ticks. As with any ins insecticide, repellents are insecticides themselves, legal insecticides. The label is the law. I don't know how many of you heard that mantra. You, you follow the label. Um, and you can buy these sprays, to, uh, fill in stream, agricultural supply places, places like that. These you permethrin sprays. And you don't spray your clothes when they're on you. You just follow the label instructions. I, I like to hang on the clothesline. Some people just pen it on the ground and follow the instructions. And the, the manufacturer claims that these sprayed clothes will, this, the permethrin on them will, will last up to six washes. An alternative is you can buy permethrin impregnated clothing. I have a set of those. I got it from running to Canada Day last spring. Okay. And uh, uh, these, they say that the manufacturer claims it will last up to 70 washes, which is essentially the, the life of the clothing. I, I've talked to one or two people who have gotten a little skin reaction from permethrin from permethrin clothing. I haven't, but you, you just so that apparently some people uh, might. Again, you're, you're weighing risks here, and how much time do you spend in tick habitat? Like that. And this just shows the uh, with the permethrin spray. Okay. Um, your best tool, your best friend at home is your clothes dryer. Okay. Clothes dryer kills all stages of ticks. So, what's a very good thing to do is when you come in from the, from the field, whether for work or, you know, recreation, you've been in tick habitat, think ahead, have, you know, what the farmers used to call a mud room, a place, you know, that's now outside your main house where you can change, have your inside clothes ready to change into, Take off your field clothes, put them in a plastic bag as soon as possible, and put them in the dryer. Don't wash them. Washing doesn't kill the ticks. It's the dryer. It's the heat. Um, and uh, I, I put it in uh, on hot for, I think the recommendation is at least 30 minutes. I put it in 40 minutes because I assume the dryer has to heat up. But you can find the details of this. Also, there's research pointing toward that if you take a shower within two hours of coming in from tick habitat, that reduces the, the, the risk of getting bit. You wash some ticks off you, but probably even more importantly, it helps you to check your body. Which would say in that, that this is the single most so important thing you can do, is a daily tick check when you are in tick habitat. You know, it need to be part of your regular routine. Flush, floss, tick check. Okay. And again, Dr. Friday pointed out, the, these are some classic places. We have some infographics out here. These are on our website. You can download them. These are for some display um, on, on where they find. They like those dark, hidden places where they're out of the way. Of the morning. And, and, you know, this is an actual graphic from the Rhode Island, you're from Rhode Island, I guess it may you know, make use of every opportunity. <laughs> okay, so again, we do find a tick, you just the question, is it really a tick? Um, and again, the black-legged tick is in terms of Lyme disease, that's the only one that can carry Lyme disease. Um, when they're in gorge, they're a little bit harder to identify. And, you know, you know this the a, a entomologist, a diagnostician, can look under a microscope to confirm because the mouth parts differ. You know, you wouldn't be doing that. Uh, but the mouth parts do uh, yeah, kind of pretty. Yeah, right. Are, uh, do vary in them. And then you can take a picture of the tick. Our program will let you can identify the tick for you if you desire. You can take a picture of it and you can email it to Joelle, and she kind of is a clearinghouse for this. Or uh, if you want to. Uh, uh, mail the tick to her. So we also have produced these these, these tick cards, which uh, there's, there's a tick card in each of these uh, uh, our tick kits, which again, as Mark mentioned, are on sale for filling out the survey form. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, so you know, 
this, this, then we, I, my supply, I also usually kind of hand out individual ones, but my supply is getting slow. Although, if there's anybody interested, I have quite a few Spanish ones with me. <laughs> Take check every day. This one, again, uh, you know, they spend a little while getting to where they want to be, and they feed for a while. It's not like a mosquito that comes whack, whack. And then just the mouth parts again. Okay. Removing an embedded tick. Um, one of the models who works a lot with ticks says it's always a bad idea to squeeze a bag of germs that's connected to you with a straw. Okay. So, you know, this is a no no. A blunt tweezers where you're squeezing the body of an engorged tick, trying to pull it off. What the CDC recommends is a very finely point tweet your tweezers. And uh, we did a lot of work investigating those, and in the tick kit is the tweezers which we settled on. I'm sorry? What about the tick twisters? The tick twisters they give the back? Yeah, again, my, my mantra is two things. You want to avoid agitating the tick as much as possible, and the only thing that CDC currently recommends for humans is a very fine pointed tweezers, as mm -hmm. close to the skin as you can, and with a slow upward movement. So we did have a little video, but that's not going to work too. <laughs> And um, now there was some recent research published from Ohio State which compared three products uh, favorably, but they compared that to median points, tweezers, not fine points. <laughs> That's, by the way, like the sliding spoon, but they're dealing with fur. So again, if, if you have a tick that's, that's bitten you, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think as Dr. Farney indicated, you, you should have a conversation, you know, with your, you know, you, you, with, with your physician. And say, you say the tick at least to, um, yeah, as, as part of that. Okay, now this is more in habitat management, and uh, pull this a little quickly. So this is one schoolyard where we found ticks, and, uh, for in terms of property management to reduce for black legged ticks, again, that they need the high humidity. So it's vegetation management that you're dealing with. And so this is a school that they have this swing set. And I mean, how many of you are kids or maybe adults, you know, swing the swings and jump off? So right into tick habitat. <laughs> and so with our suggestion, they did cut back. And uh, <coughs> the problem was that the insurance company was too heavy, that's a wetland there. And so now it's exposed water. And so, ignorant us, you know, we asked, well, why don't you move the swing set? I guess I, guess. So won't the ticks, so I, guess I did. Won't the ticks crawl on the gravel or not? No, they can't survive it. They won't live it. But could they cross over, say, upside down? Well, they, they, they're not likely to cross over it. They might be carried over by a mouse yeah, or a deer or something, something like that. that. They may drop off. So yeah, that doesn't mean you couldn't it. find a tick on the gravel. It, but, but it's definitely not tick habitat. <laughs> Okay, and then reduce, reduce habitat for those two host species. Mouse habitat, uh, such as here, here, and th there's some interesting work pointing toward invasive plant species of, uh, uh, this is work in Connecticut, I believe, yes, that with the Japanese barberry, which is a bad uh, invasive plant uh, of our woodlands, you can take over woodland and brush. And um, they found more. They found more ticks in in um, stands that uh, had barberry, which were not controlled. It's believed that's because the uh, uh, the white it makes good habitat for the white footed mice. And they found so just quickly avoid tick areas if you can. Dress appropriately. Repellents are a tool. <laughs> tick checks are very important. And if you find an embedded tick, remove it properly. Uh, <coughs> So that does not mean, you know, you shouldn't go outside. I compare it to poison ivy. You know, we all know there's risk with poison ivy. But we have, we, we have learned to identify poison ivy and the steps to, to take to avoid poison ivy. Same with ticks when we're outside activities. 
And this is our website, Don't Get Tick New York. That's a claymation video on it.